by the FDA. She also holds an appointment at the Department of Biostatistics here at the Harvard Christian of School of Public Health. And she has been appointed as an expert panel um, by the Foundation of the National Institute of Health Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, or OMO, known as OMO. And um, Mary Lou is going to talk today about um, can, can online data lead to uh, the early detection of drug-related adverse events. So there are many things she could be talking about. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very Sonia. much. Thank you. you know, it's such a great pleasure to be here. I graduated 19, almost 20 years ago and under Alex Tutelogy, which for which I'm forever grateful. Um, and everything I learned about epidemiology was all from Alex. I remember when I practiced, I was like, oh, I remember this on this book, the uh, inferences, uh, you know that book, the little pamphlet you publish on the page, whatever, that I look it up. I had that book with me as a Bible, it, uh, it, it is the first five years when I go out to the real world and practice epidemiology. Um, so um, unlike some other speakers I think the school have had, um, I have been practicing epi, I did not even do a postdoc. I think after I graduated, I went directly to work for drug companies um, and then ran on with a consulting company called Analysis Group uh, right around the corner here at Prudential Center. Um, and I've been there for about 15 years. Um, as a partner right now, um, and we actually employ quite a lot of students from HSPH. Uh, I know Tianxi, her students also, uh, and and um, Jamie Robbins, uh, Dr. Robbins' students. We have, I want to say, about 20 students uh, from uh, from uh, the HSPH. So it has been great. I have, feel like I have never left because I'm just right down the street. Um, so uh, and. And again, after this talk, if you guys have any questions, I'm around um, either today or in the future, so feel free to, to keep in touch. Um, so uh, for today's topic, oh, thank you. Go back. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, these are issues related to so-called pharmacovigilance, which is quite different from pharmacoepidemiology. And, um, I, I don't, at least when I was a student here, I, I don't think, except for the, the seminar in pharmacodemiology, that course where we had maybe a lecture or two, we were exposed to so-called pharmacovigilance. Otherwise, I think the school curriculum, I don't know whether it's different now, but at that time, was really focusing on pharmacoepidemiology. I think for good reason. Uh, because pharmacoepidemiology, we can say it's real science. You do case control study, cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, whatever, and you, are to, you, are, you have hypothesis. You want to test hypothesis. Pharmacovigilance really is one step before that. Uh, we call it hypothesis generating exercise. And the reason it's not at that cal you know, if you think about the hierarchical evidence, the quality of pharmacovigilance really is at more towards the bottom of hierarchy uh, because it's usually only, you only have numerator. You only have adverse event reports. You don't have the denominator. You don't know how many patients are taking the drug. So mo most data sources we have for so-called pharmacovigilance um, is uh, numerator-based. So you think about if you have a database that only gives you patients who report adverse events, you don't even know the denominator, who are taking the drugs and how many. H how you, you cannot even calculate risk. You cannot even calculate incidence rates. None of those epi measurements can be calculated. So then you can say, what well, is this garbage data? And we all know this phrase about garbage in, garbage out. However, in real world, this is, uh, this, is, this is one of the data sources that are very important to public health. The FDA has this so-called MedWatch system where they collect adverse event reports based on so-called spontaneous reports and voluntary reporting from physicians, healthcare, other healthcare professionals, consumers, and so forth, for the purpose of early detection of drug safety signals. And I want to emphasize this is signals. We are not ve verifying is there a causal relationship between the drug and the adverse event yet. That's what pharmacoepidemiology will do. We're talking about is there a drug safety signal? It's like a detective work. Um, in a pharmacovigilance circle, we sometimes think about ourselves as a little bit like detecting terrorists in the national security. It, it, it's 
very similar. So think about 911 at that time. How would you know to look for flight, flight school records? How would you know those terrorists would have attended flight school? Right? I mean, after, then after that, the, the whole thing unveiled, then you start looking for crews of where the next terrorist may happen. Drug safety is, is a bit like that. You don't know what adverse events could pop up when a drug is used in a large population. Granted, from clinical trials, you get adverse event reports from a limited population. As you know, clinical trials, you often have hundreds of patients, uh, and it's a controlled setting, protocol-driven setting. So from clinical trials, you get some good uh, ideas about expected adverse <coughs> events uh, from drugs. Now, I think expected a lot of times, these are related to pharmacological properties of a drug, and you can expect <coughs> this drug with this mechanism of action, you may expect these adverse events. And also because trial duration is relatively short, so usually you see more acute pharmacological reactions rather than chronic or long-term. Um, adverse events take more time to be discovered. So, uh, so given all these limitations uh, from clinical trials, um, and the real-world data, the pharmacoepi type of work we do, takes years to build. Um, because drug, once a drug is marketed, you have to wait for a couple years at least for the data to start accumulating to mature. Meanwhile, if you are at the FDA or you are at the EMA in Europe, European Medicines Agency, what do you do? Um, you, you deal with these pharmacovigilance data. So what I, uh, in this research, what I did was in, in addition to the FDA's MedWatch system or the European uh, visual-based type of uh, spontaneous reporting system, can we use the online data as a way to detect drug safety signals? Um, and as we all know, with the advent of the internet, we have all these patient postings, patient support group postings, you have the Facebook chatting, you have Twitter chatting. So what prompted uh, me and my colleague to do this research was to take on this so-called big data concept. There are big data out there, so should we take advantage of that as a pharmacovigilance tool? Um, and but before we do any of these, I know the big data is a very sexy term. Everywhere you go, people talk about big data. Uh, but I think we as epidemiologists all have to keep in mind data are as good as how you mind it. Uh, if you don't mind it scientifically, you can generate very spurious conclusions from from a pool of data that is very confounded because it's real world and um, as you all know from your <coughs> epi, uh, courses, it's all self-reports. You have no way to verify the accuracy of patient self-reports, whatever they chat online or tweets or uh, on the Facebook. All of these caveats really link to the quality of the data. And before we generate any conclusions, we really need to keep the quality in mind. Um, and so this is just showing that because of the advent of the IT and, and web, there are so many things going on in the web, and it's a vast database that's self-growing every day. It's grow and grow with all this information. Um, and there are hints that regulatory agencies may require drug companies to start looking into these data as part of the pharmacovigilance program. Um, and as a, a background, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with drug industries, drug companies are required right now by the FDA to report adverse events. It's mandatory for them. For you and me, it's voluntary. But if you, you work in a drug company, you hear an adverse event, you have to report it. It's mandatory. Um, so now the issue is, should FDA expand this mandatory requirements to say now you drug company need to mine the online databases? the online chats, the Facebook chats, the, tweet, the Twitter chats to report adverse event or not. So this, is a, a, this will be a big uh, expansion in the pharmacovigilance. And right now, technically, it will be quite difficult for drug companies to comply. Um, so but FDA has been giving talks at uh, 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 pharma conferences about moving in that direction. Um, and the uh, European uh, agencies also have talked about pos the potential of start mining of these online data. Um, so what I, what, what, what I did with my colleagues here is uh, we 
take an online data source and then we compared adverse event patterns we observed in the online data source to the FDA's MedWatch report and see whether it served as, is it a replacement, is it a complementary data source, or is it, does, does it really offer information one step before the FDA may watch data? Is, it, is there any incremental values of mining these online data sources? So we chose two drugs as example. Um, the two drugs we chose, uh, one is Lipitor, uh, a 12 stat, and a lot of you, I, I think 10% of Americans are on, on this drug. It's a very widely used drug, loading your uh, lipid, um, and it's, it's very, supposedly have very safe profile because uh, they are over-the-counter versions <coughs> being developed. Um, and so it's a safe drug that seems to have a good effectiveness for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular events. And the second example we chose is, um, is quite diametrically different. It's a drug called uh, Cibutramine. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's not a surprise because it's not on the market anymore. <laughs> Uh, it was withdrawn from the market in 2010 by the FDA. Um, and I'll talk more about that product. Basically, it's a weight loss product. Um, and at the end, the, the FDA deemed the risk benefit. It's, it's just so, so much towards a risk par. And they withdraw the product. Um, so the, uh, and, and for, for a Toba statin, uh, like I say, it's the best-selling statin on the, in the U.S. now. They are generic available, so it'll be even more widely used. And for, a, for statin drugs, there's a well-known uh, drug uh, adverse event called uh, uh, rhabdomyolysis. That's the medical term. Um, or we can call it muscle pain in, in layman term. And I, I, I was actually, when we look at the online posting, it was very interesting to see no term of rhabdomyolysis ever mentioned by online postings. <laughs> um, but as the FDM at watch uh, reports have a lot of professional terms submitted by physicians use the term of rhabdomyolysis, although they mean similar things. Um, and the subitromine uh, meridia uh, um, is a drug made by uh, Abbott. Uh, so at the t it was a, both drugs were approved around the same time. Um, Lipitor was approved in 1996. Subitromine was approved in 1997. Subitromine was uh, withdrawn from the market in 2010 after the FDA required EPA to conduct a so-called post-marketing requirement safety uh, trial called SCOUT. And in the trial, uh, they found compared to the placebo arm, the subitromine patients have 16% higher risk for developing cardiovascular events such as uh, fatal or non-fatal MI stroke uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and on the benefit side, they did not find the weight loss amount being different. So you weigh the risk benefit, the FDA decided to withdraw the product. Um, so given the <coughs> two drugs have pretty divergent risk benefit profile, we thought it would be a good, two good case studies for us to contrast with. So the online data, we, we chose this website called askapatient.com, um, and mainly because uh, their usage policy would allow us to, to take their data for free and to do for research purposes. Otherwise, a lot of, uh, a lot of online data sources actually have a very strict uh, usage policy, and you have to get their approval, they have to review your results, um, and sometimes they charge a fee and so forth. So, uh, and also this website uh, is one of the websites the FDA mine as well. So that's how we chose this website. Um, and on this website, the, post, the, um, the format is actually pretty simple. You, have, you enter the date, uh, and you enter your age and your gender, and then there is an overall rating. Basically, when you talk about this drug, <coughs> income, you know, in combination of the benefits, the risk, you are you are experiencing overall how happy you are with the product. So it's one, two, five, five being the best. Um, and then there are two free text fields. One is designated for side effects. Another, it just says comments. You can enter anything you want. Um, so that's the, that's the data structure for that. And for the FDA's MedWatch data, as I mentioned, this is a FDA uh, uh, 
spontaneous reporting uh, system for post marketing surveillance. <laughs> it's a volunteer reporting system. Uh, and the reporting rate has been really difficult to quantify uh, because it varies by drug and so forth. It also has a form. Uh, the FDA is a, is a fixed form. So uh, you, we will know the data report. We know who reported in terms of are you a healthcare professional, are you a consumer, are you a caregiver, uh, and so forth. Um, patient age and gender it's also on the form, but you have to remember, since this is voluntary reporting and there's no way for the FDA to go back to verify the accuracy, there are a lot of missing information. It depends, the quality of reports really vary. Um, and there's so-called metra term. So one advantage of the FDA's database is that, so we as consumers, you can report, I have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, whatever, from after I think it's because of the drug, but there is no way for, for FDA to verify the causality because they don't contact you. Um, and the FDA, however, will standardize the term. They have a, a dictionary, so-called adverse event dictionary. Uh, it's called METRA. Um, and so the adverse events, after the, the review, medical reviewers review the NetWatch submission, they will standardize the terms. So in a way, you don't have this online reporting. People may be saying the same thing, but with different words. Um, the drug names are also, uh, the drug names are not standardized by the FDA. Um, so we usually search by, by names and then with some tolerance for spelling errors. Um, and on the form, we ask the reporter to do self-assessment on etiology. Do you think your adverse event is caused by which drug? So you can enter primary suspect drug A, B, C. Um, and you can also this so-called concomitant medication, <coughs> which um, I just so happen to be drugs we are taking right now, but you do not think in your self-assessment your adverse event is caused by the drug. Um, and also the FDA's MedWatch um, form uh, uh, has an outcome field uh, where the medical, evalu the medical uh, assessor uh, who reviewed the report would assign whether the outcome for the patient was serious or not. And there's a regulatory definition for being serious, which means you either, the patient either die, or being hospitalized, or had permanent injury, or the event was life-threatening. So these are regulatory definitions. So now with these two different data sources, uh, we basically um, compare uh, the, the adverse event profiles for these two drugs. So I think, um, And another method we used to, to basically evaluate the correlation between these two data sources is a time series analysis called Granger causality test. Um, so I was asking Sonia before the, the meeting whether this is a method the school has taught students, um, and looks like maybe not. So maybe it's, it's worth it for me to spend a few more minutes on the methodology. Um, so this is a, method really used in e economics. Uh, the, the, so in a nutshell, what it's trying to do is when you have two time series data like we have in this case, you can think about the X being, say, the online posting data. You have frequency of reporting. And then the Y says the main watch data. And again, you have your distribution of reporting, frequency of reporting <coughs> over time. <coughs> the, the range of causality test is trying to assess whether does the time series X predict the time series Y with a lag time of it will, it will tell you, the, the test will tell you what's the, this lag time. Um, so mathematical equation, I think this is easier for me to explain by mathematical equation. Uh, so uh, Granger causality, by the way, Granger, uh, as a background, he won Nobel Prize for economics in 2003. Um, he invented Granger causality test back in 1996, so 34 years after, after he invented the test, he, he was crowned the, the Nobel Prize. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons uh, he won Nobel Prize was because his Granger causality test became so widely used in the financial industry and macroeconomics uh, research. 
So if you, can, if you look at this, the financial industry, what they would like to predict is the stock price. So they would like to see uh, their other time series, <coughs> time dependent factors, help me predict the stock, the next stock, the future stock price. So that's the, that's the widest application of Granger causality test. Um, and by being surrounded by economists in my firm right now, I have learned this technique and I found it has so much similarity to epidemiology because they, they, in economics they are interested in causa causation as well, just like we are in epidemiology, especially in pharmacoepidemiology. The causation is, does a drug cause a side effect? In the presence of all the confounders and all the demographic factors, clinical uh, profiles of the patient. In economics, it's, it's very similar too. And actually in macroeconomics, you have even more confounders. You have political factors, you have international relationship, and you have a you know, terrorist attack, and all of these things totally unpredictable. That could affect the stock price, or the stock trading volume, and so forth. So they, they are interesting also identifying factors that determine the next stock price. Um, so, what Granger causality test was doing, and uh, the reason is one of the reasons it's so widely used in financial industry because it's, it's pretty intuitive. Uh, so let's say that Y is the is the next stock price you want to predict. Okay, it's the future stock price. So what Granger causality test? It, it's basically uh, these are all continuous variables. So it's a it's a lean, we're talking about using linear uh, auto regression model. So you have a constant. And then one of the predictors is the past values of Y, so the past stock price. The test is try to test, can I predict the future Y using the past values of Y <coughs> alone? <coughs> or <coughs> is this S, which is the, um, is the, in this case will be the S of patient.com, or is this S, the new time series, can help predict the future value of Y? So the now hypothesis is to test whether all the beta coefficients jointly equal to zero. So meaning uh, the future value of y, the now hypothesis is this, the next future value of y can be predicted by the past values of y alone. I don't need any other factor. So if any of those beta coefficients are not equal to zero, then you overturn the now hypothesis. That means any of the past values of x offer some predictive, uh, predictive value for the future value of y. That's, that's basically, the, in a nutshell, what it does. And since he invented this uh, causality test, it has been expanded to, you can think about inserting other covariates too, to this. So then the, co the interpretation will be, is the future value of y uh, can be predicted alone by the past values of y as well as other covariates alone? or would this new factor x offer any new predictive uh, power to the future value of y? Um, so if the null hypothesis is rejected, meaning some, uh, some data in the past values of x can predict the future value of y, then we have this term <coughs> so-called x. The time series of x is, is say to Granger cos y. So this is the, the way economists would say it. They would call it Granger cost. Um, and what that means is then X contribute to the explanatory power of future value of Y over and beyond using the Y value uh, itself. Um, so I will present the time series analysis results um, after the descriptive um, results here. So this is just basic background about the two data sources. So take Lipitor as an example. Uh, so this is a time period where we were able to scrape the data from the asapatient.com. And this is the MedWatch data we got. Um, and the reason MedWatch data is one year behind because the FDA has a lag time in entering the adverse event reports. So this is, a, we, we conducted this project um, in December uh, last year, so back at that time, that's the latest data we could get. So here are the, the sample size. Um, the proportion of male-female looks similar. 
age is substantially lower <coughs> in the online source, <coughs> which is kind of expected. Um, so in terms of the muscle pain uh, adverse event, what we found is 67% of all the online postings about Lipitor is about complaining of muscle pain, muscle ache. It, however, in the main watch data, about 16.5% is related to muscle pain. So what that means is in the main watch data, you have a much more diverse set of adverse events being reported. There's a much wider range of different adverse events uh, that captured by the main watch. Whereas in the online source, it seems more concentrated. So uh, almost uh, two thirds of the reports are for the same adverse events in this case. Also in terms of looking at the seriousness of the adverse event, for the asapatient.com, we try to impose as much as we can the same definition the FDA used for MedWatch. Um, like I described earlier about if the adverse event lead to deaths, life-threatening events, or hospitalizations, um, and based on online posting, only about 2.5% of the adverse events were classified as serious. But as based on the FDA MedWatch data, it's much higher, 39.0%. Um, these are all statistically significant. And Lipitor has been one of the most popular drugs. The overall rating by patient satisfaction is two, about two out of five, which is below the average. Um, and for patients who reported muscle pains, it's lower, 1.7. And for those who reported serious pain, it's even lower, 1.3. Um, so about uh, Cibitromine, if you recall, this is a weight loss product that was strong on the market. Um, in both databases, we see majority of the reporters are females. The age, again, is substantially lower in the online source. And in terms of the cardiovascular issues, this, these are the adverse events leading to the withdrawal of the product based on the clinical trial scout. So you will see about uh, Fourteen percent of the reports in SAPatient.com um, is about some sort of complaints about cardiovascular events, and uh, uh, among those complaints, only about three patients, so it's eight percent, was serious events. And in the MedWatch data, you have roughly about the same slightly higher talking about cardiovascular events, um, but the vast majority, sixty-two percent, are serious. And what was really surprising to us is the overall satisfaction rating by patients online is four out of five. They love the drug. Um, I, I read some of the patient posts, it was like, this is the best drug. I lost weight, I'm not depressed anymore. Uh, and so this is patient evaluation. It's very different from sort of the real, the real clinical profile of the product. Um, and cardiovascular issue is uh, among patients who reported cardiovascular problems, uh, their satisfaction is 3.5 uh, out of 5. And among those who have serious, uh, reported serious cardiovascular problems is 1.7. Um, so I would say the biggest surprise to us is, is the overall satisfaction rating by pa patient self-assessment. It seems very different from what we perceive as whether it's a good drug or a bad drug. Um, And this is sort of descriptive. Um, we were trying to map what patients reported versus what's on the uh, FDS and MedWatch uh, data. Uh, and as you know, the patient reports is, is basically words, whatever they describe. And we were trying to match it to the MedRA terms from the FDA. Um, so uh, the, the ones that you know have A's, I try, these are other terms, we try to link them together. Um, so I would say the take home from this exercise is again, see, so the concentration of patient reports of particular adverse events, and with MedWatch, uh, you see a more diverse distribution across uh, different adverse events. And this is for cibitromine. Um, you also see, you know, the high percentage of patient complaint about specific adverse events, dry mouth, headache, insomnia, um, and then the MedWatch again has more <coughs> scattered distribution across different adverse events. Um, 
And another thing we notice is the, the adverse events patients seem to report at online source tend to relate to more quality of life issues. Um, physicians probably would dismiss insomnia. Come on. <laughs> It may not be even worth reporting, you know, to the watch system. Um, but patients, it affects patients' quality of life. These are things patients care about. Although they may not be clinically important, you may not, you probably won't die from it. Um, and you probably don't see a doctor. Maybe you do, but uh, a lot of time you may not need to even see a doctor for it. But it bothers patients, so they talk about it. Um, so um, what basically what we found uh, is that if you just look at the top, say the top 10 adverse events from asapatient.com, it accounted for already 84% of the total reports, whereas in MedWatch, it accounted for about 45%. And for subitromine, you see similar patterns. Top 10 adverse events accounted for almost you know, 86% of all the postings in the MedWatch report. The top 10 accounted for about half of them. And like I said, in the answerpatient.com, we found most comments seem to pertain to the same few non-serious quality of life related adverse events. Um, and actually, I, I, I don't have a slide here, but we also look at the Google search. And we found the Google search uh, results are pretty similar to answerpatient.com. It seems that the, the, across web sources, the they are pretty uh, consistent with each other. So about Granger causality test, this is a time series analysis we conducted. And the hypothesis here is to see whether askapatient.com can offer an even earlier drug safety signal than the MedWatch data that the FDA has been using. So this is just plotting uh, over, uh, overall MedWatch report by frequency. The, the asapatient.com is in yellow, and then this is the, the blue one is the FDA MedWatch uh, data report, uh, by reporting frequency. Um, so this is visually give you a sense what they look like. The next page is uh, for cibitromine, uh, uh, Meridia. Um, so you may see a little bit more correlation, one peak may be right before another. <laughs> so the Granger causality, here's a Granger causality test results. Um, so Granger causality test actually tests both ways. Does online predict MedWatch? It also assess the other way around. Does MedWatch predict online? Um, so the, the first top panel here, the now hypothesis is the online data source does not Granger cause MedWatch report. <coughs> so what we found is for Lipitor, the p-value was not significant, meaning there's a basic disassociation between the two data sources. They're pretty distinct from each other. Um, for, however, for Meridia, what we found was um, you see some statistical significance here. Uh, for all the reports, as well as the subset of cardiovascular reports. So, uh, and the, the, the Granger causality test showed that the lag time of four months and nine months was statistically significant. Uh, so what we did, we actually Granger uh, tested uh, time interval, the, the lag time up to 12 months. We tested all, all basically one, two, three, four, five, six, until 12. Um, so the two that came out significant was four and nine months. So if you recall in this uh, previous graph here, uh, what it suggests is around four or nine months before, um, you see the peak of asapatient.com, then subsequently you see a peak in MedWatch. And the other way around is look at whether MedWatch, patient file MedWatch reports, does, or, or um, does that make somebody more likely to go online and post a, post a, a comment, and that doesn't seem to pan out as much. Uh, except for the cardiovascular adverse event for subitromine, and you see it's significant here. Um, and so we, uh, there is a term so-called Granger feedback, stochastic model. So this could be one of those cases where 
you have one cause the other, and then that one it causes the next. So x cause y, and then y causes the next x. <laughs> it's a bit looping here. Uh, but I would say overall, it looks like um, it's more the the online posting may have some predictive power for to see the the main watch by about four or nine months ahead of time for Soviet running, not for the patrol. So here, actually, I would like to pause because this is the part that I have been trying to explain why that's the case because it's not consistent between the two drugs. Um, and based on the risk-benefit profiles of the two drugs, I haven't been able to sort of really come up with a good explanation why that's the case. Um, could these be just purely statistical coincidence? I think we can never rule that out, right? Um, or is it really, for certain products, maybe online data can help you get an earlier signal. But then what kind of products would that be? Um, I feel I've been talking all the time. I mean, what I, I want to say when I was at school, what I learned the most is um, it's really from my classmates um, and then my professors by having really interactive discussions. And I know Alec was most famous for just like pointing at you, like ask for your opinions about something. So, so you always have to read your material beforehand uh, to have uh, sort of interactive discussions. Um, so I just want you guys to feel free, you know, if you have any thoughts about this, because um, we have, I, I, it has been, this has been something that I've not been able to raise. Yeah. Uh, is the demographic of what? Of what patients would use different drugs, and what patients would use the would use the uh, website to like post reviews on. That be maybe like I can imagine weight loss drug would probably skew a bit younger than Lipitor. Yeah, and yeah. that that would also coincide with people who would be be kind of facile with using using kind of like an online forum to talk about it. I see. That, that's a good. That's a good. That actually is a good hypothesis. So what you're saying <laughs> is um, for drugs that I use. By younger population, they will be more engaged in the online posting, right? And then so as a result, they could be more predictive for the real, uh, the, the, the real safety problems physicians maybe later on detect. I like that. I will put that in my discussion <laughs> section. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess on similar lines, I was wondering if you controlled for any other factors in this analysis, or was this purely just Right. Yeah. Because if you put in factors like mm -hmm. maybe things like that, I wonder if they would somehow show, take away some of the, the correlation that you mm -hmm. Right. Did you, or was it just. No, we, we actually did not put in the covariate uh, vector uh, in the analysis. Uh, and my, one of the reasons, because they, honestly, there were just a lot of missing data. <laughs> As I mentioned, the, the FDM and watch data, you think about age, gender, these are basic demographic, it should be there. No, I can tell you even for age, you have about 50% missing. And that's really the challenge of working with these data. The, no. So, but that's a great point. I'll put that in as well. Because based on these unobserved valuables, uh, unobserved values, basically they could potentially explain, right, the difference between the two drugs. Karen? So how many of these ask a patient websites are there? And did you compare maybe different one of them you mentioned Google also uh, but I could imagine that there are a lot of them and that you could maybe take advantage of some other ones I've never seen one but I say um I have to say I was actually surprised by not so many postings I also look into uh they were <coughs> the most popular patients on the <coughs> website um and the numbers are below 100 um so uh, a possible ex um, extension, you know, Facebook. I think it's um, it would be good, um, and Google search. The, one of the reasons I don't like it so much because you know when you search something, it doesn't have any context. At least postings, you get context, you get narrative, you see what patients are saying. But when you search Lipitor, muscle pain, what does that tell you? Right. Uh, so all you have are search terms, um, and Twitter is not so sure. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, the re one of the reasons we did not go to Facebook is because we had to pay <coughs> quite some money to get the data. Um, and so at that time, financially, 
we, we, we basically look for a data source that's, that's free for us to use at a time. So both things are for free? Yeah. Yes, it's a free. Can I ask a question about MacWatch? Is that uh, uh, for everyone or is this for clinical trials? I mean, participants attend, attend a clinical trial, right? So, you know, I think I, Ellie, I think we really need to tell the school, especially medical school, to have a MedWatch uh, in the course because I found most physicians have no idea about MedWatch system. So as a result, nobody reports. So as consumers, it sounds like how many before today? How many of you have heard of MedWatch? Oh wow, actually that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically a government set up surveillance system. Anybody can report it. So as extreme as I'm on the bus with somebody who say, oh, I took this drug, I really hate it, I could not sleep that night. <coughs> then file for that person next to you, to the MedWatch system. It's as extreme as that. So anybody, everybody can report. Um, in the MedWatch uh, system, however, six, about 60% of reports are from physicians. So it's more physician dominant than consumers. And the online posting, I think they are all patient self-reports. So, so in terms of the source, that's the, the big difference. Um, and because it's, even if when physician file a MedWatch report, it's totally voluntary. So it's not like you have to report an adverse event when you see a patient suffer a side effect. No, you don't. And in fact, is that most physicians haven't even heard of MedWatch to even think about reporting it. Um, so there is a, a distinct possibility, I would say it's there, it's under-reporting. We just don't know how many real adverse events are out there and what's the proportion being reported. You just don't know. So that's that's really the biggest problem so, with numerator. from the distribution, it sounds like MedWatch has more severe. Yes. They have more severe reports. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. report on severe symptoms. Right, right. So my, uh, my, my thought about that is since it's, uh, over 60% are made up reported by physicians, so if you are a clinician, you probably would report only if you think it's a significant event. Um, and yeah, Alex? Well, you for sure wouldn't would only report if you thought it was a causal relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's striking me that maybe the, uh, uh, the social media is giving the patients more conviction that what they're experiencing mm -hmm. is in fact causal. Other people have been doing it. <coughs> right. And maybe we're actually seeing that information getting transferred to the physicians mm -hmm. from the patients. Yes, I've read about five other people on Reddit who had exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might lower the barrier mm -hmm. to MedWatch reporting because it's, it's a little bit time consuming to do oh, it. Oh, yeah, it is. On average, it takes 40 minutes to fill out a MedWatch form. Um, so it, it does add to clinical time for physicians. Um, but again, consumers can report it themselves too. Um, so that, that, that's, that's a great point, Alec, because I do observe herd effect in the online posting. Somebody says something, and then you have people piling in, like, oh, I have the same thing. So you have this cluster herd effect as well in the online posting. It's almost like a community. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we see the concentration of few adverse events <laughs> reported. Uh, people kind of share the same experiences online. Um, Some questions over here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Very good, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you think about Granger causality test, it's really a linear autoregression model. You think about when you, whenever you run a linear regression, right, you are assuming normality, that sort of issue. So if you have small sample size, the normal distribution will not hold, right? Um, so when, when I look at the outputs of these, uh, however, though, the subitromy, so in Granger causality test, um, you know, the p-value I reported here, um, I took it from the likelihood ratio test, but the Granger causality test, when you do it in Stata, it actually gives you five different tests, like aka information criteria, uh, basic information criteria, and, and, and so forth. So it gives you different statistics for you to evaluate how consistent the results are. Um, 
So these actually were all consistent across all different tests. So which was I was surprised too. Um, and so if you look at, I think, I think these peaks right before MedWatch kind of contributed to the to the strong correlation. Although, like you very well <coughs> observe, the sample size for the as a patient, you know, for these peaks, uh, this is the sample size for as a patient. It's it's a, around ten or less, and the MedWatch is much higher. So I I don't think we can rule out just the statistical coincidence. Yeah. Just because you know one is not predicting the other, it, it doesn't mean that one is not detecting something earlier. <coughs> just, I mean, I feel like they're almost getting at different types of yeah, events. Yeah, I totally agree with you. So um, that that was one of the conclusions we drew as well. Is um, I mean, the the time series analysis is really evaluating one dimension, <laughs> which is uh, you know, sort of in response to the FDA was saying. Follow our company should look into online data. Does it provide any incremental value, right? Um, and I think it does, um, and which uh, I will elaborate in a minute. Uh, but also in terms of timing, because the FDA's MedWatch system, it's kind of our first line of defense in drug safety in this country. Uh, the FDA mine that database, and when they see signal, then they, then they start thinking about doing pharmacoepidemiology studies. So can online data be so offering information even one step ahead of the MedWatch system. So that was this particular, you know, about the time dimension we were doing for grandeur causality test. But it, that itself does not speak to the, the value. I totally agree with you. Yeah. It seems like sort of related to that, there could be a difference because, like, Lipitor is such, you said it's such a safe drug that there's kind of a lot of <coughs> maybe both of the reports, both the patient and the physician reports are maybe quite noisy So what you're saying is, if the safety profile is sort of more evenly distributed, rather than subitrum in the cardiovascular, it's like a distinct adverse event, then you can see the association more than if it's like everything looks about the same, then you don't have the particular sort of the peaks to, yeah. And also, yeah. Like, are the, the peaks because like more people use the drug, so you expect to see more people reporting whatever sort of I see, right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what the peaks actually mean for like the two different systems? Right, right. I see what I mean. Right, because the first thing is then the denominator will increase, right? So then in, in a way, for any adverse event, there would not be a particularly high proportion because the denom denominator for laboratory is so big. That's a good point, too. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I was wondering if you considered only looking at Asapation.com postings that have a, had a rating below some threshold because maybe if there are drugs where people are just reporting their sat overall satisfaction, those wouldn't predict future uh, MedWatch reports, but negative reports on Asapation.com might. So I see. establishing a uh -huh. threshold where you count that report might be. Mm -hmm. And also maybe because especially in, in MedWatch there's a lot of month to month variation in the counts of reports they receive, just bidding to a larger time unit like forty five days or two months might make a difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So uh, <coughs> uh, for the online posting, I remember when I reviewed some of them. It's interesting you mentioned that because in the online uh, community I think we classify the posting being positive or negative sentiment. Based uh, on the text. Right, based on the text. Uh, and I would say most reports have both. So it's not like this report, this patient posted, everything is donkey dory awesome. Usually they say both the good and bad. So for both for most postings I have both positive and negative embedded in the same posting. So uh, actually in a, one of the slides I skipped was about methodology. It is that in that case I counted that in both the positive and ne negative column for the same report. Um, yeah.
yeah, we did not make a judgment as to whether the positive outweigh the negative, which one should be weighted more. We just put both into both. Yeah. Um, um, so in, in terms of the, the conclusion, um, the, so I think for both, for in both case examples, we see <coughs> online reporters are younger. And that probably is going, is going to stand true uh, based on the population. Uh, and and uh, the, the online reporters tend to focus on fewer and less serious adverse events. And for specific AEs, now I have some good clue <laughs> as to what are the, those could be. The online source may give earlier indication of adverse events compared to MedWatch. Um, and also, to your point, I think, to me, the online data source um, is, is complementary to the FDA's MedWatch system. Um, that given that we have seen most postings are non-serious uh, from the online data source, um, I think we need to bear in mind, uh, uh, because they are, they are, they, right now, if you think about from pharma company perspective, when they re what the FDA wanted them to do is to scrape the online data source, convert it into MedWatch report, they will all eventually get into the MedWatch reporting system I worry about dilu dilution. Then you have a, this, oh, this online source that has non-serious quality of life type of issues. Now they are going to the MedWatch system. Now then would that mask the more clinically important events that we usually see in the MedWatch? That, I think that was when we, because you think about regulatory, that's eventually where they will end up. So it seems to me it's better to keep them separate because they offer different types of information. Yes, so I know that we just they were showing us the more um, patient centered outcomes that they were reporting for the obesity medication, like insomnia or depression in a population that is probably obese and having twenty percent of insomnia is all expected. So yeah, yeah. of course they're going to report these things that are important for them, but probably not caused by medication. Right. Due to this 20% of events in the medical system, I think they can reduce things and uh, not to mention that the effort and mind that is going to go into doing that rather than to doing all the more useful mm -hmm. to balance systems uh, right. the and company. So I think it is that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I, so while writing this paper for publication, and, and I think that's one of the sort of policy I'm not sure whether that's the right direction the FDA wanted to take, um, given what we have observed. Um, but again, we are only taking two drugs as examples, and so um, you know, we want to be cautious about how generalizable our findings are. Um. Maybe one more question. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. 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 I 